Chapter 32, The Statutes of Life, Ezekiel Chapter 33. Although God obviously intended for Ezekiel's message to apply directly to the people of his time, certain underlying principles remain timeless, as does the profitability of all Scripture. 2 Timothy 3.16 Those guilty of corrupting the message that God gave to Ezekiel shamefully minimize the present-day application of Ezekiel's message. They hyper-divide the Bibles. They limit Ezekiel's application to a different dispensation with little to no application for the church today. Yet the Apostle Paul wrote that the things written about past peoples and times were written for our admonition so that believers could avoid the pitfalls that caused them to displease God. 1 Corinthians 10.11 Now all these things happen unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. 1 Corinthians 10.6 now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Romans 15.4 For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. How could Paul claim that the things written concerning past peoples and generations were for our examples, examples and learning, if the underlying teaching would be deemed heretical concerning salvation? Yet, let's follow Paul's admonition and consider the implications of Ezekiel's message to today's society, a society prone to blaming others for their circumstances in life. How could Ezekiel address today's average church member? He might say the following to the present generation, Look in the mirror and repent. Your life is in peril because of your own sin. Quit blaming God's judgment upon your ancestors. Quit blaming God, period. Quit blaming the government, the school system, the economy, the environment, or anyone apart from yourself for the choices that you make and the fallout from those choices. Ezekiel chapter 18 is only one of the three primary chapters in Ezekiel that has been grossly misinterpreted to teach a faith plus works salvation. Ezekiel chapter 33 is yet another. Understandably, the context and conditions set forth for Ezekiel chapter 18 equally apply to Ezekiel chapter 33. If a man ceased to do right, his past good actions could not preserve his physical life from the consequences of his present bad choices and actions. He would die prematurely, and only God's grace and mercy could spare a sinner from hell's flames. Conversely, if a wicked man repented and turned from his sin, his current righteousness extended his life and delivered him from the once deserved early death. Verse 12 clearly describes the contrast of physical deliverance, living longer, versus falling or dying. Ezekiel thirty-three twelve. Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of thy people, The righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness, neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. The point is to live right, live longer, experience deliverance, or live wrong, die maturely, fall in death. This same theme permeates the whole book of Ezekiel, every chapter and every verse. Do right and live, do wrong, refuse to repent, and die early. Ezekiel was simply not addressing eternal life or eternal death because that is not the context of the discussion. He was writing to people in captivity and offering them a guide for physical survival during their captivity using the same principles found throughout the Bible. Their very presence in captivity due to their sin indicated they were already in physical jeopardy. The Statutes of Life Inconsistent living could not sufficiently warrant continued life upon the earth. In fact, God appointed the watchmen to warn those trusting in their past righteousness if they begin to live wickedly, trusting in their past righteousness to escape judgment. The backslider was warned that his past righteousness would be forgotten, making it incapable of delivering his soul from death. Ezekiel 33:13. When I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trust to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousness is shall not be remembered. But for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. 
Unfortunately, Christians corrupt the effectual working of God's work by limiting Ezekiel's message to a people dead and gone, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Yet Ezekiel has a present-day spiritual, practical, and doctrinal warning for every Christian who thinks that God turns a blind eye toward his sin. Even today, a man can keep man's laws for 30 years but one day decide to commit cold-blooded murder. All the right things the murderer did in his first 30 years of his life prior to that act should be forgotten, and he should be put to death for murder, Romans 13, 1-5. This same concept expresses the whole context in Ezekiel, and specifically chapter 33. Do right and live, do wrong and die prematurely. Those living in the Babylonian captivity could not keep the sacrifices required under the law. Yet even the sacrifices under the law were intended to restore fellowship between the guilty person and a righteous God, Leviticus 5, 1 through 6. The law said that the statutes and judgments of God were for a man to live in them, Leviticus 18, 5. Those who committed the abominations were defiled and needed cleansing, Leviticus 18.30. Repeatedly, the watchman warned the righteous not to trust in his righteousness by choosing to live wickedly. Additionally, Ezekiel warned the wicked not to continue walking in his wicked ways, or he would suffer the life-ending consequences. Amazingly, Ezekiel told both the righteous and the wicked to walk in the statutes of life. Look what happened when God pronounced judgment upon the wicked, and the wicked believed God and did right. Ezekiel 33:14. Again, when I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, if he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right, if the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he had robbed, walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of his sins that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. He hath done that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. Those under the law who desired to have a longer life were to walk in the statutes of life. The wicked could hear the judgment was coming and repent of his wicked ways and do right and live. The whole issue revolved around life and death. The wicked who started doing that which is lawful and right by walking in the statutes of life extended his life expectancy. A person who wanted to have a long life would do what God said to do. The issue concerned walking in God's statutes to live. If Ezekiel was referring to all this as a matter of being saved by works, who then was saved? Was it the righteous man who trusted in his righteousness? Was it the wicked man who turned from his wickedness? Or was it that righteous man that happened to die at the right time before he turned to wickedness, although his right living initially afforded him longer life? The Bible repeatedly tells us that Israel was to do all these statutes, that he, God, might preserve us alive. Deuteronomy 6.24 And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. A man's righteousness and Israel's responsibility were to do the statutes to preserve us alive. Self-preservation was the point of keeping the statutes of life, not earning a place in heaven. There are many New Testament examples of this restoration put into practice. Zacchaeus is one such example of a sinner who met Jesus and by faith said he would restore fourfold the things he had falsely taken. Luke 19.8, And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Zacchaeus said he would restore fourfold, abiding by David's pronouncement, Second Samuel 12.6. Unfortunately, man can only see the outward act of repentance, whereas Jesus could see inside the man. Christ saw the faith that produced the work, and Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is the son of Abraham, Luke 19.9. Jeremiah and Ezekiel, one congruent message. While Ezekiel warned those held captive in a foreign land to be careful not to trust in their own righteousness, Jeremiah promised a blessing to all those who trusted in the Lord. Jeremiah 17, 7. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. God warned the righteous not to trust in their own righteousness, and Jeremiah pinpointed the object of one's trust, the Lord. By studying what 
these prophets actually wrote rather than privately interpreting the Bible. It is inconceivable for anyone to claim that Ezekiel taught a works-based salvation. This is especially true if one takes the time to examine what Ezekiel said within the intended context of Scripture. In Ezekiel chapter 33, that context opens with the responsibilities of the watchmen to warn the people of impending physical dangers. It was the responsibility of the people to heed the watchmen's warnings. Ezekiel 33, 2. Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchmen, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. The watchman warned the people concerning the impending physical danger. If the people heeded the watchman's warning, they delivered their souls alive. If an individual refused to heed the warning, his blood was upon his own head and he died. Obviously, this concerns physical deliverance, as does heeding the watchman's warnings concerning walking in the statutes of life. While Ezekiel chapter 18 dealt with the general subject of personal accountability for one's sins, Ezekiel chapter 33 dealt more specifically with the responsibility involved in the citizen-watchman relationship. As it pertained to the individual, refusing to heed the warning meant that his blood shall be upon his own head. Yet heeding the warning meant that he shall deliver his soul. As it pertained to the watchman, refusing to warn others could endanger the people and lives could be cut short. Yet the man who died did so in his iniquity. But the watchman was held responsible for failing in his duties to warn of impending danger. Ezekiel 33, 6 but if the watchman see the sword come, blow not the trumpet, the people be not warned. If the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. The analogy given concerning the watchman of the land had a greater purpose, to explain the responsibility Ezekiel bore in warning the house of Israel concerning their impending judgment. Ezekiel was God's appointed watchman. As such, he was to receive God's warnings and announce the warning to the wicked. When God passed down the sentence of death, it was Ezekiel's responsibility as God's ordained watchman to Israel to warn the wicked so that the wicked would be given the opportunity to get right with God and live. Ezekiel 33, 7. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus ye speak, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how should we then live? Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? The context clearly decrees that the point of the passage was the watchman's accountability for the preservation of physical life. Ezekiel's responsibility was to warn, yet it was the wicked man's responsibility to heed God's warning from the mouth of the watchman. If the wicked believed the warning, he repented and lived. If he refused to believe the warning and repented not after hearing the warning, he prematurely died. It is that simple. It is inconceivable to teach that everyone who failed to heed the warning and died ended up eternally damned. A synopsis of the point of these chapters in Ezekiel. If the righteous ceased to be righteous, he was judged according to the judgment of the wicked, and his life was shortened. If the wicked ceased to be wicked, he was judged according to the pronouncement toward the righteous, and he lived a longer life. Nothing is clearer and simpler than this. Ezekiel 33:18. When the righteous turneth from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, he shall even die thereby. But if the wicked turn from his wickedness and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live thereby. Verse 18 offers a synopsis of the book of Ezekiel and really the whole Bible. The righteous cannot trust in his past righteousness if he chooses to live contrary to God, and the wicked can 
get right with God and live a longer life. Wise unto salvation. Paul wrote to Timothy that he knew the scriptures prior to the penning of the New Testament that were able to make him wise unto salvation through faith. Those who teach an Old Testament works-based salvation must consider how Paul could write such an admonition to Timothy. If people were saved by works in the Old Testament, these books would have contradicted the truth about salvation through faith, but they complement each other, not contradict. 2 Timothy 3.15 And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. How can these Old Testament scriptures make anyone wise unto salvation through faith if the Old Testament teaches a works-based salvation deemed heretical during the present church age? Simply put, they teach nothing of the sort. We are saved and kept through faith. Romans 3.24 being justified freely by his grace through redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Ephesians 2.8, For by grace he is saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. 1 Peter 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again, verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith, unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Those who point to Ezekiel's works-based salvation have got it all wrong. The point of Ezekiel chapter 33 is lengthened life or shortened life. Those who chose to live right lived longer than those who would have had they chose to live wrong. Those who rejected the warning and chose to live wrong died an earlier death. The truths of live right, live longer permeate the scripture from beginning to end. Even the tree of life, which enables a person to live longer, is only attained by doing right. Revelation 22:14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the holy city. Those who teach that eating of the tree of life bestowed upon a person eternal life need to read the section of this book on the tree of life, which refutes any such heresy. Now, attention turns to the last of the three chapters deemed problematic by the Works for Salvation proponents, chapter 3. This is the end of chapter 32. Chapter 33, Die in His Sin, Ezekiel chapter 3. God sent Ezekiel to the house of Israel to speak God's words to them, Ezekiel 3, 4. Because of Ezekiel's witness, the people would know that a prophet had been among them, even if they chose not to listen to the words or heed the warnings, Ezekiel 2, 5. Sadly, God warned Ezekiel that this rebellious people would refuse the dire warnings issued by Ezekiel. Ezekiel 3, 7. But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me, for all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. It is important to note that God's spokesmen were not then, nor are they now, judged based on producing results. Instead, God simply requires faithfulness of his stewards, 1 Corinthians 4, 2. Regardless of how Ezekiel's audience received the message, Ezekiel's responsibility remained the same. Issue the warning. God knew and recognized that Israel was a rebellious house, Ezekiel 3.9. These truths established the context as to why the watchman was to give warning to the people in the first place. Ezekiel 3.17 Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word of my mouth and give them warning from me. As Israel's watchman, Ezekiel had a clear message from God. The warning began with the focus upon the wicked and the watchman's responsibility to issue that warning to the wicked. The warning to the wicked, repent of his wicked way to save his life or else he would die in his iniquity. The choice was simple and plain. Believe the message and act upon the warning or see one's life cut short. Ezekiel 3.18 When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. An individual who died in his iniquity died for one of two reasons, because he was not warned or because he refused to believe and heed the warning. However, it was the underlying belief that must be recognized as the true cause for anyone's premature death. 
Every man that died in his iniquity died because he refused to believe and trust in God's word, including those who received no additional warning at the mouth of the watchman. Additionally, due to Ezekiel's God-given position, he bore a level of responsibility too. Results and outcomes were not the issue. Faithfulness was the issue. Ezekiel 3.19 Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. The wicked were not the only ones in danger of a premature death. In fact, Ezekiel was told to warn the righteous not to trust in their righteousness, to keep them alive. God gave the scenario where a righteous man turned back to sin, and God placed a stumbling block in the man's path that caused him to die. Bottom line, if the man sinned, he was accountable for his sin. But if Ezekiel failed to warn the man, God would also require that man's blood at Ezekiel's hand. Ezekiel 3.20 Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin. And his righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Unfortunately, this one phrase in verse 20, dying as sin, has caused some otherwise respectable Bible teachers to throw out all semblance of sanity along with their civility. The problem is compounded when any Christian places an unhealthy emphasis upon man rather than always keeping the right type of focus upon God and the work of God. Those who focus upon man and not upon God generally read their particular biases into the scripture. For instance, there are those who believe that Ezekiel taught that a man must work for his salvation. They believe that someone who has died in his sins died that way because of his unwillingness to work hard enough or long enough to earn his salvation. These teachers associate this warning from Ezekiel to the warning Jesus issued about those who die in their sins in John 8. However, Christ's words and his context are quite clear and definitive. John 8, 24, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. The hyperdispensationalist may stress context, but discounts the context when it contradicts his preconceived notions. A careful reading of what Jesus said would thwart Satan's attempts to attribute salvation to a man's righteous acts. Consider what Jesus really said. He specified why those addressed would die in their sins. Those who die in their sins would only do so because of unbelief. In fact, the Lord told a story of those who died in early death, an early physical death, with the warning that his audience would also die early if they refused to repent. Luke 13.1 There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay, but except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Of those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. In the words of Jesus, John chapter 8, those who refused to believe died in their sins and for no other cause. Those who refused to repent in the Luke chapter 13 scenario died prematurely. When Christ's warnings were heeded, men believed on him and gained life. Right living could also extend one's physical life. When Ezekiel's warnings were heeded, men were granted extended physical life, but the eternal aspect was never addressed by God because that was not the focus of the warning in Ezekiel. Even the righteous needed to be warned to continue doing right so that he shall surely live. Ezekiel 3.21 Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live because he is warned also, thou hast delivered thy soul. The context throughout Ezekiel's focus squarely upon life and death. Despite the differences between Ezekiel and the words of Jesus, the key in both cases was belief in the God-given warnings. A man who heeded the warnings of Ezekiel did so by faith. A man who refused to heed the warning did so because of his faithlessness. It is as simple as that. Those who believed lived longer, and those who refused to believe died prematurely. The teachings found in Ezekiel correspond perfectly with the initial teaching of the law as given by the Lord through Moses. God gave his word to his people so that they could do what his word told them to do and extend their life expectancy. Be sure not to miss the emphasis. 
Deuteronomy 30, verse 14. But the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. Here are the major points and applications of the law for those under the law. If you do right, you live longer. If you do wrong, you die. God warns the righteous not to trust in his righteousness and begin to live wickedly or he will die. God warns the wicked to stop living wickedly and start living right and he will live. Deuteronomy 30, 17. But if thine heart turn away so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land whither thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he, that is God, is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. The purpose of the law was plainly presented in Deuteronomy and elsewhere. Obedience was a matter of life and death. The obedient prolonged life, the disobedient did not experience length of days. Verse 16 says that Israel was to keep his commandments, that thou mayest live. If the people refused to obey, their days would not be prolonged upon the land. They were told to choose life to live. Simply, let the Bible say what the Bible says without the preconceived doctrinal biases to understand difficult or obscure passages. Plainly, obedience through a belief in God's warnings extended physical life. An unwillingness to believe God's word and repent from the disobedience brought about premature death. However, it is also important to note that we are not told that those who died prematurely lost their souls for an eternity in hell. Quite to the contrary with the many examples available in scripture. Samson, a life cut short. It is always wise to test one's belief against the totality of scripture. A few case studies found within scripture should either confirm a faith-based salvation or a works for salvation theory. For example, consider Samson. Did he die in his iniquity? If dying in one's sin or iniquity involves dying a premature death because of one's disobedience to God and refusal to repent at the warnings of God, Samson indeed died in his sin. Samson broke his Nazarite vow and sinned by going in to the Philistine woman without any attempts to right the wrongs. Even his final act was a suicidal act of vengeance. If a man's eternal state was directly tied to dying in one's iniquity, or based upon whether he died doing good works, Samson would certainly have found himself in hell after his suicidal act. In fact, only God's grace and mercy could have landed Samson in paradise. So was Samson saved. Where did he end up after he died? All we know for certain is that Samson was mentioned by name in the Hall of Faith, Hebrews 11.32. What landed him there? Faith, mercy, grace. In other words, Samson lived an undeserving life, and only his faith, based upon the grace and mercy of God, could have gained Samson entrance into paradise. In fact, consider the last words of this man of faith. Judges 16.28, And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee. Only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. Now consider the dilemma Samson presents for the works for salvation proponent. If Samson went to hell, his inclusion in Hebrews chapter 11 needs some type of explanation. There is no record of Samson ever bringing any sacrifice to atone for his sins and iniquities. The Spirit of God came upon Samson when he was in the worst spiritual states. The Lord departed from Samson when his hair was cut, breaking his Nazarite vow. God used an ungodly Samson to bring about his will. God's enemies blasphemed God because of Samson's carnal acts. Obviously, no prudent Bible teacher would ever extol the virtues of living like Samson to earn one's salvation. He was not a righteous man who was saved by his works, yet he was obviously a saved man mentioned by name in the Hall of Faith chapter in Hebrews. He went to paradise after his death, but he went there sooner than he should have because of his disobedience. Since he judged Israel for only 20 years, 
one could make the case that his work for God was cut in half. Judges 16.31 Then his brethren all the house of his father came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtel in the burying place of Manoah's father, and he judged Israel twenty years. Samson judged Israel for only twenty years. Why only twenty years? This is half of what David reigned. Josiah also reigned forty years. Solomon reigned forty years. The early termination of his judgeship shows what sin will do to the disobedient. Samson's life and service for God was cut short because of sin. This is exactly what the scripture means when it says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die, Ezekiel 18.4, Ezekiel 18.20. Had Samson demonstrated a repentant heart and offered the required sacrifices, his life could have conceivably been extended, or at least not cut short. If there was a law given which could have given eternal life, it would have been by God's perfect and righteous law. Yet the Bible says that this type of salvation just was not possible because of the weakness of man's flesh. However, the law did allow a man who sinned against God's commandments to bring the necessary sacrifices to extend his longevity. Saul, a disobedient king. Samson is not the only Old Testament example of someone who may have died in his iniquity. Saul certainly sinned in calling up Samuel from the grave through the witch of Endor. The Spirit of the Lord had already departed from Saul, signifying that God was finished with him as king, 1 Samuel 16, 14. In like manner, God's mercy was taken from Saul, apparently about the same time, 2 Samuel 7, 15. Despite this, after the witch conjured up Samuel, he assured Saul that he and his sons would be with Samuel in paradise the next day. 1 Samuel 28:19 Moreover the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me the Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines disobedience cut Saul's reign short and this act with the witch cut his life even shorter However, his soul still went to paradise when it left his body at death. He certainly died in his iniquity, and he will spend an eternity in the presence of God. The law pronounced the judgment against the soul that turns toward those with familiar spirits like the witch of Endor. Leviticus 20, verse 6, And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. Because of Saul's wicked behavior, he was cut off from among his people. He died the next day, and Samuel's pronouncement gives no indication that Saul and his sons were all simply going to join Samuel in death or on opposite sides of the great gulf. Moses refused entry into the promised land. If considering the examples of Samson and Saul are not sufficient, consider the very man God used to give the law to Israel. Moses was the meekest man upon the face of the earth, Numbers 12.3, and yet he was not without sin, Ecclesiastes 7.20. Although he was greatly used by God to lead the people of God out of Egypt, Moses was not allowed to take the people across the Jordan into the land of promise. Why? According to God, it was because ye, Moses and Aaron, believe me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Numbers 20, verse 12. Aaron died later in that chapter and was gathered unto his people. Numbers 20, 24, which is an Old Testament assurance of salvation. Moses lived beyond Aaron, but when he again requested to go into the promised land with God's people, God reminded him of his sin that hindered him from entering the land and said that like Aaron he would be gathered unto thy, that is, the father's people. Numbers 27, 13. Certainly Moses died because of his iniquity, and the same was true of Aaron, yet both went to paradise. Like Samson, Moses was also mentioned in the Hall of Faith, Hebrews eleven twenty four. These all died in faith. Obviously, faith was and is the key. There is no other way to please God apart from faith, Hebrews eleven six. Historically, it was the key both to lengthen the physical life and certainly life after death. The same holds true today for the children of God. Faith in the God-given warnings meant that a man turned from or avoided altogether the rebellion that would send him to an early grave. Someone dying in his iniquity in Ezekiel had nothing in and of itself to indicate a man's eternal destination. Now attention is turned to addressing another misconception. This verse from Hebrews mentions those who died in faith. Hebrews 11.13 These all died in faith, not having received the promises, 
but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Those who teach that a man who died in his iniquity ended up in hell, likewise teach that someone who died in faith was saved. In fact, Hebrews 11.13 has often been referenced as teaching in the past and at present that men had to die faithfully serving and believing the Lord. While it is certainly our desire to die with that kind of testimony, this is no excuse for an improper interpretation of the passage. Read the verse again. What does it actually say? These, the people in the immediate context preceding verse 13, all died in faith, not having received the promises. They saw the promises afar off, but they did not receive the promises prior to each of them dying. Therefore, they died in faith concerning those promises that they saw, but had not received. They were strangers and pilgrims on the earth because they did not live to enjoy the fullness of the land that God promised. Just as dying in iniquity had absolutely nothing to do with going to hell, dying in faith in Hebrews 11.13 had nothing to do with going to paradise. Still not convinced? Below is a list of many of the Old Testament characters. The Bible does not offer one instance where a man's work proves salvific. Quite the opposite. In fact, if works or faith in works saved a man, why does the Bible not make this plain? How much work had to be done before a man was safe or saved? Not even one of these people lived a sinless life, so who did enough to earn salvation? Not even one of these people obeyed God perfectly. Even those born after giving the law fell short of any measurable standard. In fact, many of them could not have kept the law because they had no access to the temple, sacrifices, and priesthood while in captivity. How much of the law did they have to keep to merit God's favor? 10%, 25%, 50%, 75%. Does James' admonition concerning the law not apply? James 2.10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. The Bible offers no justification supporting a faith plus works for salvation philosophy. While it is true that faith produces action and it is the action which we see, the action produced by the faith has never saved anyone from hell. The book of James defined dead faith as faith that does not produce works, James 2.17 and 2.20. In fact, the only way to see a man's faith is by what he does, his works, James 2.18. Yet faith is evidenced by works. The only way to show the faith of anyone listed below is by what someone sees that person do. To avoid further confusion, one must understand that belief is not faith, James 2.19, because one must exercise that belief or the belief remains simply a dead faith. If you continually believe, you must exercise what you believe. That is true faith. Every person in the Old Testament was responsible for acting upon the revelation of God given to them at the time they lived. Preaching to the Spirit in prison. Those who dogmatically adhere to any form of a works for salvation system understand the implications of such teachings, that men will be able to boast that they made it to heaven based upon their own merit and that their eternal reward is reckoned of debt. Ephesians 2.8 for by grace he is saved through faith that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans 4.4 4. Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Because of the unsavory and unscriptural nature of such teachings, men scurry to and fro in the pages of the Bible in hopes of finding some new dogma to bolster their teaching or at least ease their consciences for such a teaching. In attempting to make this man-made doctrine more palatable, they force the Bible to say things it simply does not say. One of the futile attempts that has risen suggests that men in Abraham's bosom had the gospel, the grace of God, preached to them before Christ emptied paradise. Consider the implications of such a false teaching. First, it must be taught that men were awarded a place in Abraham's bosom by their faith plus their works. In other words, they earned, deserved safekeeping contrary to Scripture. However, if those in Abraham's bosom subsequently made it into heaven, the faith and works technically earned them their eternal bliss in heaven. In other words, their new philosophy eases their conscience but does not fix their problem. Paradise becomes more like a Jewish purgatory where some inhabitants get out and go to heaven and others end up condemned. To do this, men must create another doctrine, or at least twist a scriptural doctrine. Enter the proposed doctrinal solution. When Christ went into Abraham's bosom, he preached the gospel to the spirits of men. 
Therefore, the implications are that works played a role in getting men into paradise, but trusting the gospel, the grace of God, is how they secure their release into heaven. The verse used to prove that this gospel is supposedly preached to men in Abraham's bosom is found in 1 Peter. 1 Peter 3.19, by which, by the Spirit, also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. This teaching creates at least two doctrinal challenges. Number one, the Old Testament promised that those who were gathered unto the people would be gathered unto Shiloh, Jesus Christ, and two, the spirits to which Christ preached cannot be men. Shiloh, a dual meaning. First, consider the implications that some people in paradise were not gathered unto Christ at his ascension. The key to this problem involves understanding that the term Shiloh is an Old Testament name associated to Jesus Christ. Of course, any Bible-believing Bible student understands that Shiloh was a place where God first set the tabernacle, Psalm 78.60, Joshua 18.1, and the place where he first set his name, Jeremiah 7.12. However, a diligent student, however, a diligent student of the scripture also knows that Shiloh is the name of a person, Genesis 49:10, and that person is Jesus Christ. Genesis 49:10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Two important truths should be understood concerning this passage. Number one, Shiloh is a person from the lineage of Judah who comes to the earth. And number two, although there is a future application to Christ's second advent, there was an initial application at Christ's first coming or incarnation. In the spirit of transparency, it must be confessed that these truths can point to the gathering of the believing Jews at Christ's second advent. But one should also allow the scriptures to speak for themselves throughout the Old Testament. Through the prophecy given in Genesis chapter 49, Old Testament saints had the assurance that if they were gathered unto the fathers or gathered unto the people at death, they would one day be gathered unto Christ. The proof of a partial fulfillment during Christ's first advent is found in Genesis 49.11 that prophesies that Shiloh, which is Christ, would bind his foal under the vine and his ass's colt under the choice vine. And Zechariah 9.9, where the prophecy said, Thy king cometh unto thee, he is just, having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt of the foal of an ass. Obviously, this was fulfilled at least in part during Christ's first advent recorded in Matthew. Matthew 21, 1, And when they were come nigh unto Jerusalem, or were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied, and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and they brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. Gathering unto thy people. That Christ fulfilled a promise of gathering the people unto him at his first coming is clear when one considers the totality of the Old Testament scripture. The people who died prior to the ascension of Christ had two possible destinations. Number one, Abraham's bosom, Luke 16, 19 through 22. Paradise, Luke 23, 39 through 43, or number two, hell, Luke 16, 22 and 23. Throughout the Old Testament, the first destination is identified as being gathered unto the fathers or gathered unto the people. Abraham, Genesis 25, 8. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man, full of years, and was gathered to his people. Isaac, Genesis 35, 29. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Aaron, Numbers 20, verse 24. Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, for he shall not enter into the land which I have given unto the children of Israel, because ye rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. Moses, Deuteronomy 32, 50. And die in the mount whither thou goest up, and be gathered unto thy people, as Aaron thy brother died in Mount Hor, and was gathered unto his people. One may take a quick glimpse of these passages and suggest that being gathered unto the fathers or unto the people spoke merely of being buried. But the scripture teaches otherwise. 
After all, Jacob yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people in Genesis 49:33, but was not buried until his sons carried him into the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Mechpelah. Genesis 50, verse 13. Obviously, the gathering unto the people referenced the destination of the soul and not that of the body. When Christ died on the cross, he promised the thief on the cross that he would be with him in paradise by the end of that day. After three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, Christ fulfilled the promise of Genesis 49.10, and all the saints who had been gathered unto the fathers or unto the people were then gathered unto Shiloh, Christ, and paradise was taken into the third heaven. 2 Corinthians 12.1, It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Understanding the fullness of the truth of what happened to Old Testament saints as well as New Testament saints when they died clarifies the second dilemma mentioned above. When Christ preached to the spirits in prison, 1 Peter 3.19, he was not preaching to men. To prove this, we must understand one of life's greatest questions. What happens to a person when he dies? The Bible clearly teaches that every man, woman, boy, and girl is made up of three parts. These three parts are known as spirit, soul, and body. This can be seen in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, where the Bible says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The chart on page 502 describes the three parts of man. The body is the part of man seen by others. It is the shell in which man lives. The spirit, not to be confused with the spirit of God, man's spirit, is the part of him which communicates with God. Prior to salvation, the spirit is dead and must be made alive or quickened. The soul, a man's soul is the real him. It is the part of man that continues its existence into eternity, either rewarded or judged because it serves as the decision maker in man. The Bible offers two circumstances that truly define death. Number one, death involves the departure of the soul, and it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died, Genesis 35:18. And number two, death involves the departure of the spirit. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, Genesis 25, 8. Obviously, these two truths teach that death occurs when a man's soul and spirit leave his body. While this may seem simple, the greater concern is where each part of man goes when he dies. To grasp these truths, consider the next chart that deals with believers and unbelievers. The chart on page 503 deals with the three parts of man and has a chart with the believer and the unbeliever. The chart shows the parts, the body, the spirit, the soul. The body concerning the believer. The body was or is laid to rest in several ways, but eventually it gives way to corruption. The body of the unbeliever. The body was or is laid to rest in several ways, but it eventually gives way to corruption. The spirit of the believer. According to Ecclesiastes 3.21, the spirit of man goes upward at the point of death. Ecclesiastes 12.7 further explains this by saying, The spirit shall return unto God who gave it. That is for the believer. The unbeliever, surprising to some, the Bible teaches that the spirit of the unbeliever also returns to God who gave it. After all, the Lord is... God of the spirits of all flesh, Numbers 16.22, Numbers 27.16. Now the soul for the believer. The soul of man is the part of man that will dwell in one of two places at death, heaven or hell. Prior to Christ's ascension, the dwelling place of the soul of the saint was in the heart of the earth, Abraham's bosom, or paradise. After Christ's ascension, this place still called paradise was relocated into the third heaven. The unbeliever. The soul of the unbeliever goes to hell only to eventually be delivered to the lake of fire. This truth can be plainly seen in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The Bible tells us that the rich man died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, Luke 16, 23. Hell is a place of unquenchable fire and is the home of the soul for those who do not believe in or on the Lord. As the scriptures make quite clear, hell and paradise were two separate distinct places. 
both located in the heart of the earth. From one place to the next, men could see each other afar off, Luke 16.23, and could hear one another speak, if speaking loud enough, Luke 16.24. But between the two, there was a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence, Abraham's bosom, to you in hell cannot, neither can they pass to us in Abraham's bosom, that would come from thence, that is hell, Luke 16.26. One place was the dwelling place of the souls of the believing, paradise, and the other place was the dwelling place of the souls of the unbelieving, hell. Spirits of men return to the Creator. It is important not to miss a profound truth in all this. The spirits of all men, believing or unbelieving, return to God at death. In fact, there never was a single spirit of man found in paradise, and never has been, and never will be, a single spirit of man found in hell. The concept that Christ descended into paradise and preached to the spirits of men giving them a choice to make concerning the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection might sound intriguing. This is because these teachers believed that a man was safely ushered into paradise by works, but only entered heaven by faith in Christ. This is simply not true. In fact, to prove such a fallacy, one must twist and ignore many scriptures. It is amazing that people can call themselves Bible believers and harp so much on context, 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 only to refuse to consider the context when the context refutes their viewpoint. This is the pinnacle of hypocrisy. If Christ truly did preach to the spirits in prison, when he did, those spirits must have been something other than men, and they were. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which, that is by the Spirit, also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. When Christ preached to the spirits, he had to be preaching to someone or something other than man. Remember that no human spirits were ever in Abraham's bosom or in hell. If that is true, there should be something else in Scripture that God identified as a spirit that does not contradict the context of 1 Peter chapter 3. The Bible teaches that the spirits were angels, Hebrews 1, 6, and again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him, and of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. The context of 1 Peter chapter 3, in addition to the whole counsel of God, makes it clear that Christ's preaching took place in the heart of the earth on the other side of the great gulf in hell, and the audience were spirits or angels, not people. The Bible also teaches that these angels had been imprisoned in chains of darkness since the days of Noah. 2 Peter 2.4 For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. The angels that sinned in Noah's day were and are in chains in hell. When Jesus died, he did not go into paradise to preach to the saints, but initially into hell to preach to the spirits in prison. These spirits were initially sons of God, present and alive, and seen when God created the heaven and the earth. Job 38.5 Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or hath stretched the line upon it, whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy? The spirits to which Christ preached were sons of God identified in Job 38, who determined to follow Lucifer and fell into sin. The crime for which they were imprisoned pointed to their disobedience in the days of Noah. That disobedience eventually brought about the flood that destroyed the earth. In fact, all generations except Noah and his family had been corrupted as the sons of God violated God's precepts and cohabitated with women on the earth. See the comparison between Sodom and Gomorrah's going after strange flesh, Jude 7, to the angels which kept not their first estate and are reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, Jude 6. Genesis 6, 1. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, 
that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, that they bare children to them, and the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. These sons of God, angels, were the same beings that were present at the creation of the earth before the creation of man. These were angels, which were spirits, who then cohabitated with the daughters of men. According to the passage, the direct result of this unholy union was giants, and for that reason God sought out a man like Noah, whose family had not been corrupted by this unholy seed, and sent a flood to destroy the corrupted seed. When Christ died, he initially descended into the heart of the earth, where these disembodied spirits, fallen angels, were locked up in the prison house. When he arrived there, he had a short time before he had to cross the uncrossable gulf to meet the thief in the paradise. The angels who attempted to defile the seed through which the Messiah would come got to see the Christ face to face and hear him preach of their coming judgment. This was one sermon that offered no invitation, but merely promised the judgment of the great day and the vengeance of eternal fire. Jude 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, and going after strange flesh, are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. The preaching offered them no cancellation of their everlasting reservation in darkness. The problem with these new doctrines arise when men peruse the Bible attempting to prove a doctrine and fail to consider that the doctrine is unprovable. Unfortunately, it's like every other lie. One lie breeds another, which breeds yet another. No Bible believer should ever be guilty of this type of Bible abuse. Man shames God when he does not live by faith. Faith means that the creature, that is man, is dependent upon the Creator. The Word of God will have no effect upon the lives of those who believe if they put no faith in the words that they read, 2 Corinthians 2.13. Faith is always demonstrated by putting those words into action. In other words, faith is acting upon the revelation of God. Consider this list and pinpoint from the Bible the works that offered any of them a home in heaven or paradise. On pages 506... 507, 508, 509 are many of the people throughout the Old Testament that did not earn salvation. This is the end of chapter 33. Chapter 34, Old Testament Mercy and